Hi, we're coming from uh, Stena Line and uh, we're running a lot of ships and we're shipping a lot of freight and goods and we're shipping a lot of people and that's what we do. And I have two emphasis on this talk. One of the highlights is uh, digital transformation that we're doing with a, a traditional company. We, did, we are putting data-driven processes in place in in every part of the company where we can. And we're also going to present the fuel pilot project, one of our very successful projects um, in the operational demand. And our lead developer, Hugo, will present that part for you. This is Estena Scandinavica. This is where we uh, prototyped and implemented the fuel pilot. And the inception of this project is that the crew had a complicated task. The senior master, Captain Jan Sjöström, realized that they had some re pretty complex calculations that were not really fun to do. And he figured like, yeah, sure, AI, everyone's talking about AI. Can we try AI? Yes, we can. And it's been a huge success. Because when they drive this ship, it has to arrive on time and this ship burns a lot of fuel and we want to spend as little fuel as possible. It's good for the environment and it's good for the wallet. But because this ship is subject to a lot of nonlinear interactions, it's the wind, it's the current, it's the depth, in a way that Hugo will explain later. And calculating this for a trip that takes half a day, that's not really fun for a human to do. So, in comes the machine. This thing is 250 meters long, it weighs 50,000 tons, and it has engines of 30,000 horsepower. And we have put AI in control of key parts of the piloting of this. So, this is a quick slide to just set the, put the setting of our company and what we're doing. Um, we run a lot of boats and we ship a lot of stuff and people. That's about it. And we're doing it in Northern Europe and Western Europe. And we have as a leading star sustainability because we love our planet. We want to stay on it for as long as possible. So when we put in this AI systems, the data-driven approach into a traditional company. Um, we ne really need to transform everything in the company. We have the normal business processes, we have the logistics, and we have a lot of sea-going vessels. And we're putting it down in the HR department. Sorry, I'm not used to this. So we actually implemented data science and machine learning in the human resources. We're putting it down in business to increase our growth. And we're putting it down in operational excellence, where we run the ships and the harbors to reach a higher efficiency. And we all have the sustainability as a leading star. This is a great movie that you won't see because we didn't get the sound to work. Um, <laughs> But <coughs> um, this is what we're really happy about. And this is one of the highlights. This is a scale we're using to guide how we implement data-driven processes into the business. And we've taken it from autonomous drive, the cars, and we instead try to adapt it to autonomous business, a cognitive company. So at the lowest level, where very many companies start out, you have no connected data. Every data scientist knows about it. To get the data, you have to talk to the right person. They have to give you access. Then they tell you what the data is about. Nobody really knows and what the errors in the data is. And a few months later, you might have some data to work with. Uh, the goal here is to connect all data. It should be described, it should be accessible. It should also be accessible by machines. There shouldn't be 
and human involvement to get to it. Then data is analyzed, it's taken decisions, and AI is used to give decision support for humans and to give a good monitoring. When the AI is then really mature and we trust it, it's moving up a level and it does the decision making still with human monitoring. And then when we mature and really develop this, it's going to be the AI making business decisions, developing new business practices, and we give it more and more trust. Not every process in the company or the business is, is suited for going all the way. Some might stop here, some might stop here. It's a different business case for all of it. So to support this data-driven transformation, we are now putting in place a data science infrastructure. And one of the things is that we are connecting and transforming all data sources into free-flowing data in next-generation databases. We are putting in place uh, systems for elastic training loads to scale up with the demand of uh, pocking and training the machine learning models. We are setting up systems for automatic deploy and we are also setting up dashboards for monitoring automatic and maintaining because we kind of like to create new stuff, not maintain the old. So with all this uh, data-driven approach throughout the business, here we come to one of the key focus because we operate a lot of seagoing vessels and AI assist on these vessels can be very beneficial. This is the man that came up with the idea to a fuel pilot. Captain John Sjöström, and this is our head of AI, Lars. So, when you put AI assist on a ship, there are several benefits. One of them is the safety and comfort for the passengers, because when you have a complex task for the crew to monitor that they're not really fit to do, or that didn't come out right, it's difficult for humans, but easy for a machine. They have to spend a lot of their attention doing it. Uh, when we relieve them of that, they can focus on what they're good at instead. Um, another benefit is when we operate the ship in a more efficient way. We're saving fuel, we're saving the planet. Um, also, when this AI is operating the ship, and the crew is monitoring it when the AI is solving a complex task in a more efficient way than the human did it. Um, the crew is actually learning from the machine because the machine is sucking up experience, solving the problem, and they see how the machine was solving it. Before there were a lot of home-cooked theories that were really difficult for the crew to test, to test how to operate the ship. Now they see how the machine does it and they actually improve as well while watching the machine. And because we do it more efficiently, we're saving the wallet. And I really like this because most of the environmental project means you have to do something in an inefficient way or use some inefficient fuel or something and do something less good. Not in this case. We're actually doing something better. So we're saving the environment and we're saving the wallet. And I really like that. There is no contradiction. You can have it all. So on these vessels, there are some fun functions that benefit more from AI support. And in my opinion, there are a few things where humans and machines have different skills at the moment. The machine usually have a comparative advantage when it comes to solving a complex task or it comes to constant monitoring or when it comes down to quick decisions. So with this case of uh, propulsion control where the machine is taking over the engine, it comes down to constant monitoring. No human likes to do that. 
And it also comes down to solving a very complex equation, not meant for humans either. And many people fear the machine and saying that the machines will, uh, they will take our jobs. Um, that might happen very far in the future, but at the moment, I see it instead as the machines are able to assist us in tasks that we're really bad at doing. So I see it more like, how would you feel if a machine took over the tasks that you're really bad at doing and you can do something that you're good at instead? I think that's a good idea. Um, in the vessels, there is also the secondary systems that how you load the ship, what you bring onto the ship, what you need in storage, and how you trim the ship. And all of this leads to more efficient operation. There is also the ship environment. We can know where we put down the ship, what will the, we the weather be like, where do you want to be, at what time, where do you not want to be. And that gives a really efficient operation. And now I'm going to leave over to Hugo. All right. Uh, let's see. So route optimization. Why is it really loud? Or is it just me? Is that better? That's better? Yeah. All right. Um, so the problem we're facing is uh, transporting a ship, a really big ship, from one harbor to another. And we want to do it as efficiently as possible. Uh, and also be on time. We want to follow our schedule. Punctuality is really important. So this is the, the route that Stenos Scandinavica sails every day. It's from uh, Gothenburg to Kiel in Germany. And uh, these are the uh, waypoints of one of the routes that uh, it can take. And the colors represent the depth, which is uh, actually quite an important factor for uh, the fuel optimization. And the reason for it being important is that when a ship travels over shallow ground, there's an effect called the squat effect. So the pressure drops when it's shallow and the uh, boat actually sinks down a little bit and the resistance increases. So it, the speed slows down. So that's one of the factors that's important. And obvious reasons, the, the wind, uh, big ships, the wind will uh, have a big impact on the speed. And the current as the medium that we're traveling in moves, we have to compensate for that. So these are all factors that we need to work with and uh, when predicting the speed that we'll have at a given point on the route. So what we've done is we've implemented a, a system that takes the position and the, uh, the data that we have, the, the wind and the current and the forecasts, and we have trained a model which predicts the speed that we'll have given this, these var variables. And uh, these are, this function is then used in a genetic optimizer, which optimizes the route and gives us a, a power recommendation for every point on the route. So we'll know ahead of time what, what power output we will need later on and also now to be on time and as efficiently as possible. Uh, the power is then delivered immediately or directly to the engine. And the engine gives, us, uh, gives the boat a speed and uh, we get a new position. And then we keep going because we'll have new conditions at the new point. Uh, the weather might not have been correct when we optimized it from the beginning. So we have to recalibrate and redo this continuously throughout the trip. So as I mentioned, we use um, third party forecasts for the weather, so we take the weather, so we have an estimate of or a forecast of what the weather will be later on. So if you're going to Gothenburg, or from Gothenburg to Kiel, we'll know what the weather will be like in close to Kiel. And in that way, we could compensate earlier on if uh, we have strong headwinds uh, for the south, we'll be able to have a little bit higher speed in the beginning because that will reduce the energy because it's more efficient to drive a little bit faster throughout the whole route than being really fast or like high output at the end. Um, and then due to uh, some sparse data, because they've been driving the ship in a fairly similar way for many years, the data is fairly sparse. We have like, small spaces where the data is really good, and then outside that, it's, it's quite hard to 
build the model. Um, so we have dealt with some physics, uh, built the model uh, that is, is smooth and covers the entire uh, space that the the power can be in. Um, and that with the uh, genetic, genetic optimizer and the reason for genetic algorithm is um, that we don't really have an explicit uh, or analytical formulation of the, the function. And as it's smooth as well, uh, the optimization is just rather quick and it's uh, uh, quick enough and works really well. And so these then directly set the set the engine current engine power and will show the and or the and also predict the powers or recommend the powers later on. So as I said, we want to recommend the powers throughout the whole route, and it's super important to get for the officer on the bridge to accept this because they have been driving the boat for many years, up to forty years, and they know how to do it and. Then we come along and say, no, you should be using this power. Uh, and it's, it's quite intimidating standing with someone who's been a captain of a ship for 30 years and has been thinking about these things uh, quite a lot and telling him, no, no, you should be using 9.8 megawatts right now and not 11. He's like, uh. So to do that, to to help and aid that process, we have, we have uh, Develop this, and this is one of the first iterations. So what you can see here is uh, perhaps if we can I click on that. All right. If I forward again, will it pause? All right. I'll just tell you quickly. So the, what you can see at the top is uh, is the like, predicted weather forecast, uh, and it's like an average for for subsections of the the route. And uh, so you have the current and the wind, and then this turquoise line is the recommended power. And then we have the depth as well, uh, and then the the predicted speed over ground and speed through water. Uh, and this is super important because then they can actually understand where that where that recommendation comes from. So if they can see stronger winds later on and that it's shallow right now, they'll understand that okay, we'll even though it's shallow, we'll need to have a higher output now, and they'll see that the recommendation line is is uh, fairly even, which is one of their uh, ideas previously that that was a good good way to navigate the ship with fairly if you can choose one power output throughout the whole route that would be optimal almost and uh, so they're they're very happy with seeing this and that helps us uh, do this. so so this is a short time lapse nope all right the thing is this <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, it's uh, yeah, all right, yeah. I'll tell you what happens. It's all right. We'll. Uh... All right. So what happens is uh, this red line will uh, move along, showing them where they are. And the values will uh, be updated as they go along. So the uh, power outputs, or the power recommendations, will be updated as the weather forecasts get updated, and the experienced weather is also determines on the speed that we actually get. So it all updates continuously. That's what this shows, and uh, yeah. So as John Jonathan showed you, uh, this cognitive journey kind of. Uh, image earlier, and the nice thing is we can use this to map our tasks or our map our projects that we're working on onto this scale and see how far we are, have gotten, where we are, and how far perhaps we want to go on it. So back in the day, they were driving the ships completely manual. They just uh, at gut feeling set your power and they would go with that, and then they would be late or they'd be early, and then they had to compensate later down the line, and then they got this. Ada pilot, which is a estimated time of arrival, estimated time of arrival pilot, which helps them set the power and better estimate what power they actually need. And some data started being collected, and uh, and now we're at step three. We'd say so. We're we have implemented this system where 
we have machine learning models that uh, recommend, don't, uh, they don't only recommend the power, they actually set the power for the ships. So what the officers are doing right now, they're just, or not just, but they're monitoring, making sure that the values are not completely crazy, but also uh, doing all their other tasks so they don't have to spend too much time thinking about the power that is needed. And uh, perhaps this is as far as we want to go in this uh, project because we might we don't want to fully automize their work. There, there are so many other things to do, and this is perfectly fine uh, for this project. Oh, for for this project, uh, it's a nice way to. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> so looking ahead, we still have quite a lot to do, even though this is uh, shown to be quite successful. Uh, since we have quite a lot of ships, uh, we want to roll it out on more ships so we can get the savings on more than just Dennis uh, And uh, when looking at the optimization part, there's still a lot to do. Uh, there's a lot of factors that uh, contribute to how much energy is burnt or how much energy is used during the travel. So like the propeller pitch, what is the optimal there? Uh, how many engines to use? And it's going to have four engines. Sometimes it's better to use three. Sometimes it's better to use four. How often can we switch? How much does it cost to turn an engine on and off? And all these things. And uh, the trim as well, if the boat is level or if it's more on the front or in the back, has a huge impact on the actual resistance of the boat. Uh, or in the water. Um, and then other things such as uh, the ship environment, we can make use of other ships, what they're experiencing. So, um, for example, on Stena Scandinavica, throughout Gothenburg to Kiel, we have two boats going opposite direction every day. So we can make use of the data that's collected, the weather wise, or weather data, and uh, other data as well. And uh, I'll jump for the next slide here. So to verify this, that we're actually doing something good and that we're actually saving energy, we have, uh, we're working with Statistika Sultana. We have Magnus here who's helping us to verify that w and quantify the, the effect that, we're, that our system actually has. So we get a statistical significant value that with some confidence can tell how much are we saving. And uh, with a external party doing this, there's no bias as well. So we're actually uh, doing that fairly, uh, um, yep. uh, and yeah, there's a lot of features. There's a huge variance in the data. So there's different crews and there's loads of different things that affect the, the uh, how much is burnt during the trip. So uh, it's fairly noisy and sometimes they use it and sometimes they don't. Sometimes you have to overtake another boat and there's a lot of f factors that make it a little bit difficult to evaluate the actual uh, uh, impact. All right, and do you want to finish off? All right, thanks. So I just wanna, sorry, I just want to mention that it's looking very positive at the moment, even though I can't give you any figures of the... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's been a success so far. It is success, and we're showing sig significant reduction in uh, fuel. So, yeah, what I really like about this plan, this project, is that it does save the planet. And I'm leaving it with some words from some of the words that really make me happy. From Refatel's side, we're all swimming in the same boat. Take care of the environment, and yeah, uh, we are recruiting. And to, to build the data science infrastructure, if people can help in different parts with their company or something. Call me, please. Thank you. I will try to get the video working while you're Yes. Do you have any questions? Uh, hi. Thanks uh, for your presentation. It was uh, really uh, interesting to see uh, the whole scale and journey uh, you were presenting. I just have uh, one uh, one question because you were speaking about uh, the AI should help the people to make decisions, and as far as I'm concerned, there's a term called uh, competence erosion. That's where you 
where you were saying it's it's also I mean, something where you off. start to uh, learn from the artificial intelligence instead of learning from your experience. So maybe there, well, if I put a better example, a better example right now, if um, with things of, of mobile phones, there were the thought of that it was for us to use the mobile phones and the mobile phones to use us more or less. Uh, if you if you look on on a, a bus right now, then uh, most of people are looking at the phones instead of speaking to each other. So maybe we're making an erosion into competency of speaking with each other. If if you follow my my train of thought, so maybe yeah. here is is uh, you said the captain has 40 years of experience, and maybe now um, well you're saying against the, this experience. I think it's it's really good because you you can optimize it, but maybe for the next generation this competency will be lost. Uh, have you considered this from the AI point of view? Not really, but yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's probably true what you say, but hey, they can't sail a ship either. So, um, and they can't run it without a radar, and they can't run it without electricity. So, yes, we are making us dependent on the AI. That's true, exactly as you say it, but we have already made us dependent on many other things too. I don't see, I don't see the problem in this case. Uh, just, just to add a little bit. Uh, at the moment, we're not taking. There's, there's a lot of factors, and there's, they have a lot of other things to do as well. And this is one task, and they still, they'll still need to know how to operate the ship, uh, in case of bad weather or whatever. And they take, make a detour because there's also the factor of passenger comfort. Uh, so there's, a, there's still a lot. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, and this is, this is, yeah. Also, we have we have different malfunctions when this system goes offline, so they still need to operate it manually once in a while. But they're actually better at doing it now because they learn from the machine. Okay. Sounds. <laughs> sounds maturing. Fast, uh, status on the video. So yeah, it's not it's not super exciting at the moment. Uh, <laughs> so don't. Uh, but yeah, what you can see is the the, the power it, it updates and it uh, revaluates it's continuously. It's actually a ship going from Kiel to Gothenburg during the night. Yeah, and the, this trip is actually uh, 14 hours long, and uh, so it's just a short time lapse of the. Uh, so it's not on the bridge is even less exciting. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, let's give them a last round of applause.